production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. This time on Broad and High, Learn more about the city's annual open studio and stage event where artists open their doors to the curious public. It is a weekend-long self-guided studio and stage tour with 50 artists, 32 sites, 12 community partners, and 7 backstage tours. So join us for a peek inside the working studios of some of this city's talented creatives, from graffiti artists to guitar builders. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Quickle and welcome back to Broad and High. We're coming to you from Milo Art Center near 5th and Cleveland Avenues. This former schoolhouse was built in 1894 and in 1988 it was transformed into an artist enclave and it's now home to about 37 artists who work and sometimes live here in old converted classrooms. Several of these artists are participating in this year's two-day open studio and stage event. Here to tell us more about this annual event is Jamie Goldstein of the Greater Columbus Arts Council. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Kate. Well, thanks for being here. Absolutely. So tell me, what's the overall purpose? What's the gist of the event? So Columbus Open Studio and Stage is really about demystifying the creative process and helping people connect with the artists and the arts in our community. Cool. Uh, four years ago, a group of local artists came to us. It was around the time we launched the Art Makes Columbus campaign, and we thought, what a great engagement opportunity. So with the help of local corporations and foundations, we were able to launch this weekend-long um, sort of uh, arts festival, but totally self-guided. Very cool. So it's all across the city, right? I mean, Correct. how many artists, how many locations are there that people can go to? All inside 270. Uh, there are 50 artists, 32 sites. So there are sites like Milo Arts and Block Fort that have multiple artists, uh, seven stages, and 12 community partners. Stages include Ohio Theater, Palace Theater, Southern Theater, Shadowbox Live, CD125, Short North Stage. And then community partners are free throughout the weekend, and they'll have programming as well. Most of the artists are doing demos in their, in their studios, and you'll have a chance to meet them, talk with them, look potentially buy their work uh, and just uh, make a weekend of it. That's amazing. It sounds like such a great opportunity. I know there's a lot of artists involved. We couldn't fit all 50 artists in our program today, but we did have the chance to check out a few of them. Here's a sneak peek of three of the artists on the tour. <laughs> Uh, I was born and raised in the Bronx, New York. Uh, I moved to Columbus about 10 years ago. I'd like to describe my artwork as like ghetto hieroglyphics is the term that I've dubbed it. In uh, my kind of philosophy is that graffiti and ancient hieroglyphics are kind of one and the same. So I incorporate elements of both, even though they're very stylistically different, I try to t meld the two styles. I like to go out and use spray paint out on like abandoned places and stuff like that. I think that's a lot, that's really cool. I also like to make stickers out of like, like recycled like vinyl material. People throw out old like sticker scraps and I like to paint on top of that and make my own stickers. Um, I like to block print. I incorporate a lot of herons and cranes and in a lot of different mythologies. Herons and cranes are like kind of symbols of like, uh, like connectors between this world and like the world beyond. I also incorporate the thunderbird a lot. It's kind of a thing that I'm known for. And like thunderbirds are like really sweet in like uh, Pacific Northwest Native American tribes incorporate the thunderbird on. They're kind of like messengers from the gods. And they're like symbols of like power and something like for myself personally, for a long time, I wasn't the most self-confident person. So I've kind of taken the idea of the Thunderbird, this really powerful, majestic beast as a bit of a mascot, as something that I strive to be. So I kind of, as an artist, wanted to create my own mythology, but still reference the things that universally we all can relate to. 
We're distracted a lot by like social media, like we live in kind of a trying time right now. I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn from like ancient myth and stuff. People were kind of dumb. We do the same things over and over again. Hopefully soon here we'll learn our lesson and love each other a little more. Uh, I grew up in Lithuania and came to the United States in 1997. We did not have crayons there in Ex-Soviet Union. But mom saw that I had something. Some paintings are more abstract -y and some are more, you know, representational, you know, and I, I paint, you know, landscapes and florals and I, you know, take a lot of photos of sunsets and I am just obsessed and every night I run in the attic and I take a picture of the, to that day sunset and uh, then I want to portray on the canvas you know what I saw, but it's not my intention to to replicate what I just saw, but I want to, you know, interpret that it goes, you know, through me, through my lens. It's like the whole emotion. I think it's important in today's digital, you know, world, I think um, when is everything, you know, printed, prints, and all, you know, you look as... It's important that paintings were tactile also. It's just not, you know, flat, and you, know, you can touch it. And I play with different, you know, levels of textures. I rarely use paint brushes. I use all different alternative methods and I am mainly painting with my hands. I run to the sink like many times just to to wash my hands. When I was 12 years old uh, we had teachers aid. At the end of her session she gave little cards that she said, well, you know, write your dreams. It's like, who you want to be, or looking, you know, look into your future and date yourself. And this is my card, and on the back, it's like I wrote it, I want to be an artist. That's it, and you, and you, 1983. It's not a job, or I can say it's the best job ever. I'm living my dream. <laughs>
we usually are always pitting ourselves up against a white standard that like was never built for us to exist in. That trail has already been laid for white males to walk through fairly easy. And if you don't fit into that, that subject or that theme, you have to either assimilate to that or you have to challenge that system. I was reading this book uh, talking about the history of the black image through cartoons and kind of made me investigate like other identities and kind of like how we've perceived uh, like people of color throughout our entire lives through the lens of kind of cartoons and like uh, comic book strips and it's kind of built this idea, these stereotypes out of these fun images or playful images. But I also latched on to the symbol of the coloring book now, how in our millennial age, adult coloring books are a thing. And so because we were introduced to color in general through a coloring book as a child, but now color is being uh, expressed to us as adults as this thing to build your brain. You can build your brain through learning how to color. And, but in our society now, color is an issue still and nobody wants to build their brain to understand color on a social context so for me placing people of color in these in these coloring book pages and with these colored Im uh, images that are stereotypical images right so i place the stereotypical images in there with them and it kind of builds this world that they exist in, this world that doesn't exist. It's a world where we're understanding color as adults, you know, in a literal sense, but not understanding like people of color today. So it's my, my role as an artist is taking you into that world. It's like my grand hall of oppression, because I want you to feel the way I do. Being of color in this world is a gift and a curse because you love yourself, you love your identity, but the world doesn't necessarily love you back. Visit ColumbusOpenStudioAndStage.com to view all the artists participating in this weekend's event and to purchase maps for the two-day self-guided tour. Joining me now is one of the coordinators of the Columbus Open Studio and Stage, Stephanie Rond. Hey, Stephanie. Hi. Thanks for chatting with us. Thanks for having me. So tell me, what experience, what do you want people to take away from this opportunity to meet these artists? We want people to see that artists are working in spaces all over the city. And we realize that galleries can be sometimes intimidating, so we hope that people come into these spaces and ask the artists lots of questions. That's wonderful. So you're also the director and curator of the Carnegie Gallery at the Main Library Branch downtown. Tell me a little bit about what's going on there. So right now we have the Cause Preview Exhibition. So it's a sneak peek into what you will be seeing in all of the artist studios during the event. Awesome. Well, we had a chance to check it out, so you guys should take a look. We are currently in the Main Library downtown in Columbus, Ohio, uh, in the Carnegie Gallery, which shows um, the Columbus Open Studio and Stage uh, preview show. The purpose was to, uh, to exhibit the work of all of the cost artists that are participating in the, in the tour this year. We have everything from metal sculpture to ceramics, painting, photography, sculpture. There is a piece in this exhibit that, that I, I just absolutely love. It's by Laura Alexander, and it is hand-cut paper. It looks like it could be laser-cut, but it's not. It's all hand-cut, and it's layers upon layers of paper. And what she does is she, before she cuts it, she paints the back of the paper with acrylic, bright acrylic paint. And in this case, in this particular piece in this exhibit, it's pink paint and green paint. So what happens is when you look at the paper all layered together, there's a reflection of the paint 
on the back side of the paper and it makes the whole piece glow and it's just absolutely brilliant and I actually found this out figured out what her process was on last year's tour so these are the things that you're gonna find out if you go on the tour you're gonna learn all about the creative process Each one of these pieces represents the way each one of these artists work. Uh, so I think that you'll have a good idea of what you will see in the studio. Although this is the finished product and process is very much a part of Columbus Open Studio and Stage. So uh, you might not necessarily have the best idea about how they make what they make until you go to the studio. Hopefully you'll be pleasantly surprised. One of the pieces that I'm really fond of is a piece by Chris Tennant. The composition is kind of dark, but then there's these beautiful yellow dandelion flowers in the center, and it reminds me of my childhood when adults would say, oh, dandelions, they're weeds. And I thought they were the most beautiful flowers, and they were bright yellow, and you could paint your skin with them. So it brought me back to my childhood when I saw that piece. He uses a lot of rugged material, so he'll begin with burlap and wood and he'll chisel that all down and then he takes um, oil paints, which is this really fine medium and puts that over top of um, this, you know, rugged wood. I love this event, the concept of this event, because it brings together uh, well, it further unifies our city, and I feel like it gives a good overview to what Columbus is in our, is in our community. I was delighted with Kat Sheridan's piece when I saw it. It is a um, mixed media piece uh, that includes dead bees <laughs> and um, epoxy resin and clay and wire, and it's really very stunning. I chose Jen Rubelski's piece. Um, she is an artist that I love her sense of humor. I love the craft she puts into her work. She lays bits of cut paper in, in patterns and then she'll paint that and sand it and paint it again before she applies her last um, layer, which is usually a really lovely character, uh, an animal that's humanized. I, I love it. I love her work so much. <laughs> So for the 2017 tour, we have 50 artists at 32 unique locations um, where uh, artist studios, select artist studios, open their doors to the public and select uh, performance venues, open their backstages to the public as well. But the cool thing about it is most of the studios on the tour are, um, are, are, in, are in folks' homes. So these are spaces that you may not ever get to see. Definitely do not plan to get to all of them. We have a great website, use that as a resource. Also the exhibit here at the Carnegie Gallery. So we recommend you investigate the artists, look at their work, check out their websites, and then create your plan of action. Because you can't possibly see all the artists at one time on the tour. It's two days is not enough. There's still time to check out the free exhibit and explore the works by dozens of local creatives. It's on view through Sunday, October 8th at the Carnegie Gallery, located on the second floor of the library's main branch downtown. The gallery is open the same time as the library, so visit columbuslibrary.org for hours and directions. Well, we have one more stop on our Broad and High preview tour. We took our cameras to the Guitar House Workshop. Now, Steph, can you tell us a little bit about this place? Yeah, it's in Grandview, and it's a melding of everything. So it's a partner, it's a, it's a stage, and there's an artist painting as well. Awesome. Let's check it out. What makes the guitar unique is it's an orchestra in your hand. This is Guitar House Workshop. Um, 
We are a music store, primarily fretted instruments, so guitars, mandolin, banjos, ukuleles, things like that. We have the repair side and building, which is my background. And upstairs we have a lesson program with eight teachers currently. Uh, all of them are musicians in their own right, which is kind of cool. And I paint musicians. You know, we're really two artists trying to run a business. A guitar, over time, there's a certain amount of tension on it, and it pulls on the guitar. Um, weather conditions can change it. A part can just break. People drop their guitars. A gentleman just dropped off his broken headstock. He looked very worried. Uh, we see those kind of things all the time. We're kind of backed up with that kind of work. There's always a broken guitar, you know. And because the guys are visible doing repairs and, and people enjoy coming in and being able to talk to the luthiers, you know, instead of just dropping the instrument off, fix it. So they, they tend to come and hang and, you know, when they come, they're on holiday. So, um, this guitar, when it came in, um, had a lot of problems, and it, and it still looks fairly worn, but um, I like this repair because the customer, um, it, belongs, uh, it belonged at one time to a friend of his who now has passed on. A custom guitar or a solid wood guitar um, will definitely age and change if it's taken care of. Um, and it's played, it needs to be played. The more it gets played, the better it sounds. And the main thing that was wrong with it was there was a big um, damaged area here. It really took an impact and it was loose, the top was loose. And so we replaced the, uh, after we cleated the top and had to rebuild some things, and of course you have to destroy part of it to get to the area. Um, we uh, rebuilt that and redid the binding. Linda helped with the color on that to make it match. We don't want it to look perfect because it's still an old guitar. Linda has really added a lot to um, my craft, actually. You know, I view things a little differently. I approach it more like an artist as opposed to a repair guy, which I'm fine being a repair guy, but um, there is an artistry to it that I really enjoy. And we get to shape the business how we want it to be. And, um, and hopefully that attracts, you know, the clientele that we currently have. And then the other part was the headstock had been repaired, so it was broken and kind of flopping around. And um, this headstock, what we did was um, actually cut a section of it out and re trued that up and then we rebuilt that. And so now it's really stable and really strong and it's a... Uh, nice old Gibson. If it were in tune, it'd sound even better. I started doing musical imagery, or maybe focusing on musical imagery, several years ago with the Ohio State Marching Band. Realized I really liked horns, I liked the sound of horns, my dad played horn. Um, I like the reflections in horns, those kind of things. I like the interaction of musicians and crowds. And from there, I became really interested in New Orleans. You know, it's got, a, it's got all the problems that are everywhere else in this country, maybe magnified, um, but people still celebrate with music. You know, they, um, you're born to music, you get married to music, you get buried to music. Um, met John here when my son was taking lessons, started painting on location here because um, I found I was immersed in the m musical world here and I was painting with musicians around me and um, I stayed. We try to tell people, try to make it not intimidating for anybody to come in here and just because they want to play. Everybody has that desire. I don't care who you are, somebody Everybody wants to play guitar and sing a song at some point in their life, and, and you should try. Those sound pretty nice.
That's our show. Be sure to check out all of our stories at WOSU.org, as well as on the WOSU Public Media mobile app. And give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Of course, you can learn more about this weekend's Columbus Open Studio and Stage event on their website. We're taking you out today with local music by John Bolzenius. You just saw him in the Guitar House Workshop story. Thanks for watching. Be sure to join us again next week for more great stories about this creative community. Just for now, can't say yet I'm sorry. Lisa McClimate, Mixed Media. My works are focused on conveying love, truth, and patience. I want to record the emotional memories of things. My sculptures and jewelry are meant to be simple reminders of our limited time here on Earth. The most important thing I've learned is my power of positive perseverance. I've become comfortable with being uncomfortable, knowing that in varying degrees, life is always bitter and sweet. I will grow old making art. Because resources for artists are accessible here, and the spirit of collaboration fuels me to always explore and share. I'm Lisa McClymont, mixed media is my art, and there's no place I'd rather make it. You are the only one that I could love, the one that gets me every time. I was waiting for something, and now that something... Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you.